Hello, wasn't that an awesome intro? That intro was made by our very own Aaron from uh, Modsy's Retro Collection. Um, and he is uh, my co-host today for Pixel Talks Volume 2, Side B. Um, I am, of course, Nathan here at Pixel Pipes. And uh, yeah, this episode is all about ATI. We're going to talk about, um, you know, the successes, but also the uh, not successes. So, since this is side B, if you are watching this and you have not seen side A, you're doing it wrong. Uh, quit this video and go over to Mozzie's Retro Collection to watch side A um, to get ATI's successes, because this one's going to be a lot more depressing. We're going to talk about ATI's less successful uh, moments in yeah. history. And it's not because we're biased. Um, we, we just uh, spent over an hour talking about how awesome they are. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, good stuff. You feeling good about this one? Yeah, you... Uh, for those of you who have actually come from side A to side B, you might notice I've changed t-shirts, uh, especially t-shirt colors. I originally had planned to wear this one for the entire episode because this is a bit of a collector's item t-shirt. Uh, but I completely forgot, so I dropped the ball on that. Uh, but this is actually a Ruby nice. uh, ATI t-shirt. Uh, You've never looked wear it sexier. Actual... <laughs> was supposed to wear it. I don't know if it really does look that good on me, but anyway. Um, Nonsense. Yeah, I was, <laughs> was going to wear it for the start, but I completely dropped the ball and I forgot. It wasn't until we had our, like, our intermission break in between side A and side B. I went, oh, crap. I totally forgot like the most important part that I was going to do. How anyway. terrible of you. <laughs> All these people disappointed um, now. All right, so Aaron, I'm going to subject you to something that you are probably not going to enjoy, but should contribute to some hilarious moments, uh, at least for me. Uh, so this is Frequently uh, Asked Questions for Australian People by Americans, oh, uh, or at least just me. You okay. have the option to pass any of these questions. Right. Uh, okay. So, first question: How many times do you check the toilet before you sit on it for snacks? <laughs> uh, more than you probably think. Uh, no, it de <laughs> it depends on it. Absolutely de depends on where you live. Uh, I grew up in a small country town where. My grandfather's house had a second toilet, which was just a hole out the back, and you legitimately had to check uh, to see if there was, you know, redback spiders, snakes, whatever. But uh, living here in, in, you know, in a, in a city, um, no, you definitely don't have to. But, uh, yeah, in, in a country town, it's a legitimate thing you do have to, especially for spiders and stuff uh, during summer. So, yeah. Next question. If Crocodile was Dundee after the first movie, why'd he make two more movies? <laughs> Repeat the question. <laughs> okay. If Crocodile was Dundee after the first movie, why'd he make two more movies? <laughs> Pass. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I mean, they were funny. I like that guy. He's really funny. I can't remember his name off the top of my head, which is really bad. Uh, he's like an Australian icon, and I, I really... I actually recently watched a movie with him in it, uh, and oh my god, for anyone who's Australian and, and is looking at me now, probably thinking how I forgot his name, I don't know, but... Um, it's like Paul funny actor, really Hogan or something. He probably got it just right, and I'm, I still can't even verify if he got it right or not, because I don't know. <laughs> I'm a bad Australian, by the way. I'm actually a really bad Australian. Not only do I not have a very thick accent... Uh, I very rarely drink beer, and I don't watch AFL, which is our national sport. So wow, I picked the right I, person I could for actually... these, these burning questions. <laughs> Why yeah. does the Tasmanian Devil spit? No, that one's terrible. Never mind. Uh, no, 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 no. Go, I want, I want to hear that one. Why does the Tasmanian Devil spin? Oh, okay. Why does the Tasmanian Devil <laughs> Devil spin? Uh, I'm assuming this has some kind of answer, but. 
I'm assuming because it's always trying to look for its second head or something. I don't know. I, I have no. The, the, you have the answers. I don't have the answers. These are right, burning okay. questions. Thought, no, burning no questions. American okay. knows the answers to these questions. Uh, well, for reference, I have lived in Tassie for. I, I have lived in Tasmania, uh, which is the small island off the bottom of Australia, uh, for over ten years, and uh, half of my family is actually from Tasmania. Uh, but in terms of answering that question, I have no idea. Okay. But How yeah. do you all not get lightheaded and or pass out for being upside down for so long? Oh god, I snorted. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, These are yeah. all terrible. This is this is only going, going downhill from here. I think it's just a matter of perspective. You see, you you see us up the right way, but we're used to just living upside down. So we're used to our body has been designed or grown uh, evolved in a way that's the word i was looking for evolved in a way that uh we're used to having gravity affect us in the opposite direction wow so, um, a country of yeah. bats which 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 is for for women that's not too bad because it means that they're um no no their assets no no we won't go into that uh no, no, all okay. right so we'll avoid that uh last question yep was the Road Warrior depicting a post-apocalyptic future, or was that just everyday life in the 80s over there? Oh, no, that was everyday life. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah that, was, that was just everyday life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was... Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, to some extent, so was uh, Mad Max. So, I mean, that was, that was, just, that was just outback, like right. Aussie uh, in general. There really so. are just kids living in holes throwing metal boomerangs around. Yeah. 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 Which was not in the Road Warrior, but still. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we're talking about ATI's not successes here. And, you know, we like to focus more on kind of a relatively modern era of, of 3D accelerators. Uh, of course, there were, uh, you know, times before then. There was the, the pre-Radeon days, um, which I'm not that much of an expert on. I, I know a little bit about, you know, the... Rage 20, 128 and the 128 Pro slash Fury, uh, and of course the Rage Fury Max. Um, but, you know, the early days of ATI as far as 3D accelerators were very, very humble, right? They, they, had, they were mostly known for their 2D cards at this time. You're talking 1996, 97, that sort of time. Uh, they had their Mach 64 chip, which was, you know, popular. Uh, decent, you know, they kind of tacked on uh, 3D onto that chip and called that the 3D Rage. And mm. they kind of improved it a little bit with the, the 3D Rage 2. And yeah, uh, they weren't really good for 3D acceleration. And then it had the Rage Pro, which actually was built from the ground up for 3D. Had DVD acceleration, yeah. which was a big deal in the late 90s. Uh, didn't really stand out. They had the uh, Rage 128 after that. Uh, which was actually relatively competitive to NVIDIA's Riva, one, uh, Riva TNT um, and to some extent the Voodoo 3. Um, it was uh, improved, but it wasn't great. Yeah, I think, I think the 128 is definitely more suited to the earlier, like, say, the Vanta, the Vantra, Vanta, I think you have to say it, the NVIDIA Vantra and the... Um, the Voodoo 2s, I think that's pretty much where the performance of the one Rage 128 is. Uh, but it depends, again, on the application, the driver, because this was at a really bad year, a uh, really bad era for ATI's driver side of things, uh, again, uh, yeah. which seems to be a bit of a repetitive thing. But um, Which, unfortunately, they did yeah. not get out of anytime soon. You go into the, the Rage 128 yeah. Pro, they made improvements to it, especially in terms of geometry, performance, and uh, clock speeds. Wasn't really all that competitive with the other, you know, top tier cards from the competitors. And the Rage Fury Max, what can you say about that thing? It's uh, a two-headed monster. Uh, only it's worked a... occasionally. It was decent when the planets aligned and everything went well, but, you know, other times. So, yeah. Suffice it to say, before the Radeon, ATI did not have a lot of successes. And actually, if you go and you've watched Side A, which, shame on you if you haven't, 
um, we counted the Radeon as uh, among the successes. But, in a way, it wasn't a success. So we're also putting it on this list, too, because it suffered from a late release. It was not really released on time um, to, to compete with what it was probably originally intended to compete with, which was the original GeForce 256, you know, uh, the first GPU with hardware transform and lighting. It would have been, it would have absolutely murdered that card. It was built on a 180 nanometer process, just like the GeForce 256, but by the time the that card came out the GeForce 2 was out it was built on a 150 nanometer process was clocked much higher and twice as much texture uh, units and uh, yeah the Radeon simply wasn't clocked high enough yeah um, I think my my first ever technically my first ever GPU that I ever owned was the GeForce 2 and it was even though it was an integrated one it was still well and truly well above what ATI had um, at the time as well. And I think one of my friends at the time had a, uh, I think it was an LE model Radian. I think it was either a nine, uh, sorry, a 7,200 LE or a seven, 7,000 LE. He had one of the two and he was like shocked. Cause he had like, I think it was an Athlon uh, AMD Duron and I had an XP 1800 plus and my GeForce 2 integrated GPU was outperforming his dedicated video card, <laughs> uh, which was really, really funny. Uh, and um, I, in fact, funny story, same person who then upgraded to the uh, Radiant 8500, which I mentioned in, in part one. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, right. So, yeah. He, was, he, 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 he really gave them a, a good try, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. Very forgiving. Uh, yeah, it, you know, the Radeon, the value edition or the Radeon 7000, as it later became known, kind of gave that mm. a bad name as well. Uh, because that was a... Uh, to put it charitably, that was a display card. Um, it had one pixel pipe. It had none of the... Yeah. Hyper... It had none of the <laughs> Hyper-Z uh, compression technologies to help it with efficiency. Um, it had DVD acceleration still so there's that uh yeah i you don't know, know but, what else that card was really good for because it wasn't really like as, as a gamer looking to buy a card there were other cheaper alternatives well and truly above the performance of those le version cards uh from like nvidia for example even like the the geforce 2 mx range was like a better value option with more features than that card Oh no, um, that's why they put out yeah. the Radeon SDR to yeah. compete with the MX series, you know. That was that was what that was for. Yeah. Uh, the value edition, it was just, you know, it was literally the lowest end card that they offered. Um mm. I mean, you could still get like Rage uh 128 Pros and stuff like that, I guess, but you know, this one, I don't know. If you want a DirectX 7 features, I guess there you go. It had that Still yeah. had uh, hardware transform and lighting for all the good it did. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, like as as a as a team green owner at the time, it definitely wasn't uh, like while the eighty five hundred when it it came out was a good looking card. The the seven thousand series three, I didn't have much experience other than the one that my friend had. Um, but yeah, it was it was kind of interesting. Like it, it enabled me to play games like Unreal Tournament ninety nine and stuff at. Uh, I believe like 10, 1024 by 768 and he was limited to 800 by 600 and even still couldn't match, you know, the frame rate that I was getting. Um, and so, I mean, my, my onboard GeForce 2 was essentially like an MX200 uh, when it used like 32 meg of system RAM. So it by far was not even at the level of a, of a dedicated GeForce 2 uh, MX card. So uh, I'm actually yeah. kind of impressed it could do that resolution. I mean, the, the, um, the frame rate, we're talking like maybe 25 to 30 FPS, and his was getting maybe like 15 to 20. But So it wasn't, it wasn't like 60 FPS uh, Master Race right. or anything, but it was, it was still barely playable. Um, but, yeah. So, after that point, you know, ATI has pretty much a string of successes, right? Um, they do, they're doing pretty good. You could talk about the... The Radeon X800 XT series not having Shader Model 3.0, uh, 
and we did talk about that. Um, you know, but not really a failure, honestly. Yeah. There were excellent performing cards. Games didn't really need that feature at that time, at least, and not for a couple of years. Um, you know, so there weren't really a lot of missteps for a while. Um, and um, you're talking about the string of successes from the start of DirectX 9, 2002. And going through to, you know, 2006 and, like, the X1950 XTX and still, like, top-performing cards all through those generations and all the refreshes in between. Yeah. ATI was at the top of their game. They were just absolutely killing it. And then we get to the HD 2900 XT. So, to to be fair... NVIDIA really killed it for that generation. Um, the 8800 GTX, you know, this was the start of DirectX 10. This was a whole new ball game here, right? And a new operating yeah. system, Windows Vista. You know, a lot of stuff was changing in the world of computers at this all at the same time. <laughs> and you had the introduction of the geometry shader. So while it wasn't specified in the DirectX 10... Um, features, uh, nothing was saying how you had to make your chip. It was generally agreed that making a unified shader architecture made the most sense because you're supporting all these different um, instructions related to not just vertex shaders, but geometry shaders now and pixel shaders. Why would you make discrete units and some of them don't get used and some of them do get used some of the time and how do you balance that? It just it's, It was a foregone conclusion you would make a unified shader architecture. Yeah. And, yeah, the, the 8800 GTX was the first crack at that concept. And it was it was kind of a weird chip. I mean, it had an odd amount of memory. It had 768 megs of memory. It went on a 384-bit bus. Weirdness. Yeah, uh, it was very random. And this whole concept, that they called it the stream processor. It's like, what is this? Isn't a pixel pipe? What, what is a stream yeah. processor? It's like this tiny little processing unit, and there's 128 of them. And it has a 64 texture filtering units, 32 texture address units. It has uh, 24 ROPs. Um, it's just an oddball card. It had like an odd number of units and, and specifications, it had a separate shader clock. The core was divided into separate uh, shader domains. Uh, but somehow it worked. That was an amazing... The 8800 GTX is one of the most groundbreaking, uh, you know, revolutionary cards in modern times. Yeah. I feel like I need to yeah. give you some something to, to say here. Yeah, no, I was just waiting. I've got... I have a 8800 GTS 640 meg, and I had one back in the day. And, uh, I mean, I went from a... Uh, I had a 6800 Ultra, which died, which I then went to an X800 GTO, uh, then went to an 8800 GTS 640 meg, and then from there went to a uh, Radeon HD 5770. And that's a big gap, uh, a big gap that that 8800 GTS absolutely just did its workload uh, for that Mm. entire time and played all the games that I wanted to. Uh, right through that era, uh, it, it, I think it was the, also the first card that Nvidia launched that had a blower style cooler. But the the weird step down. Are, are we erasing did, the FX series from our minds? Yeah, we are. Um, <laughs> the <laughs> the uh, HD twenty nine hundred uh, originally was also it, it was designed to be competing with the GTS level cards kind of in a way and there was supposed to be a XTX version uh, of the 2900 which well it just never came to be uh, I think there were some issues with the DDR4 at the time uh, which meant that there was massive limitations on uh, production of the card uh, and I believe it just got ended up cancelled Yeah. so because it was had... kind of weird it was kind of weird you had a, the 2900 XT just the prior generation, you had the X1900 XTX, you had the X1950 XTX, 
Before that, yeah. there was Platinum Editions. You know, they always had this extra top card. Yeah. And, yeah, and, and on top of that, it was several months late. Yeah. Which is really weird. ATI has this way of bouncing between doing something early and before the ball game of everyone else, and then they're really successful, and then they just fall, fall short, come out late, features that aren't up to scratch, and then they're behind the pace for a couple of years or a couple of generations. Uh, and it's this really big up and down, up and down, up and down with them. Uh, whereas NVIDIA teams tends to, while they trip and fall sometimes, they definitely have like one or two generations of going up and up and up, and then they might dip a bit, and then they keep going up and up and up. Whereas ATI is very much like up, down, and then they might be up for a couple of generations, and they'll be really down, uh, and then they sort of slowly crawl their way back. But um, and I guess in a way you could kind of argue that they never fully recovered from the 2900 XT. Yeah, yeah. Because they uh, never I, really... You know, I guess in, at least in terms of single GPUs, they never tried to go for the top performance anymore after that. Yeah, yeah. I believe. Uh, well, I guess you can't say never. I like think the, the, I R- think it took them a few years. Yeah. Yeah, like the yeah. obviously like the Radeon R9 series was pretty much aiming for the top. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But that was that was way later. Yeah, way later. Uh, I guess the final note on the, or one of the things I was going to mention about the 2900 is there were uh, prototypes made of the XTX and there are some in the wild that collectors do actually have. So if you happen to get unbelievably lucky and you are a video card collector with maybe some deep pockets um, and you look hard enough and get lucky, you can probably land yourself one of those XTX models. Um, But they are very few and far between. Um, probably some of the rarer prototypes to actually find of cards because they never went into any kind of mass production at all. Um, so these were they're really hard to find. Uh, and they're yeah. gigantic too, which is crazy. They're some of the biggest cards I think I've ever seen, um, these cards. But, uh, yeah. Well, they would have been completely impractical. Like, I oh, have yeah. an X1950 XTX, and it's the first card with GDDR4, and let me tell you... That's a hot card. Like, oh, yeah. It, it yeah. was a massive like dr- strain on power consumption and heat production. And when the GPU itself is already doing that pretty well, uh, you end up with a, you know, just a monster. And the, yeah. the 2900 didn't really need it. And one of the things that was kind of overreaching about the 2900 XT was, just, was its 512-bit memory interface, which was insane. It was, like, the first card to attempt that, so kudos for that, I guess. Um, yeah. But it was way more man- bandwidth than it needed, even with just GDDR3. It yeah, only had it was, 16 ROPs, so it didn't even have the fill rate to saturate that bandwidth. It was almost like uh, A2I was kind of banking on, well, we're just going to up NVIDIA by, you know, rounding out to, like, a bigger number and then hoping that our GPU can clock high enough to really take advantage of that. Um, but there always seemed to be, like, the the, the uh, 2900 seemed to just have something in it that just meant that it just fell short and couldn't utilize um, all of the numbers of things that kind of went into the designing of that chip. Um, yeah, that, it's yeah. kind of, the, the odd thing about it, too, is that it didn't even really support true anti-aliasing. It did this weird, like, like yeah. shader-based version, which ended up being... A popular way to do anti-aliasing, but I think maybe that that time it was too early to do that. Everybody was using MSA. Yeah. yeah. Now of I think course that you've is... got. Sorry. No, that's right. I think it was the it's the precursor to is it uh, is it it's either TX? No, that's Nvidia's. I think it's the SM something or other. Um... Yeah, there's SMAA. There's TX. AA. <coughs> yeah, there's. Yeah, nowadays, especially with... uh, It started on consoles and it migrated over to the PC, but you do have, like, uh, shader-based anti-aliasing that's faster and less bandwidth-intensive and so on. Um, But, you know, at that time, that was literally the only form of AA that the the 2900 XT could support. So it's like, why does it have all this bandwidth then? Yeah, yeah. Um... It was just kind of a weird thing. They didn't even fix that until, like, the 4000 series. Um, right. 
Yeah, they held on to that for quite a while, I think. Mm-hmm. Mm. But, fun fact, some of you may know this. If you find a 2900 XT one gigabyte version, generally more commonly found as the 512 meg version, if you see a one gig version, it's using GDDR4. Yeah. So, in a way, that's kind of the closest we got to having the XTX model. Those yeah. one gig versions are very, very rare, though. If they do pop up, they go for a crazy price. Uh, but the regular 2900 XT, not as much. Yeah, I was about to say, I was looking to get a 2900 uh, XT for my collection, and I don't recall ever seeing any one gig ones on eBay. Um... Yeah. Um, interestingly enough, a uh, channel that uh, well, we're both subscribed to, um, which is, uh, was it F2 Tech? Yeah. F2F yep, F2 right. Tech is F2 the name F2 of the Tech. channel. Uh, he did a video in the 2900 XT, and he actually had the 1 gig card with GDDR4, which he said later on uh, in the comments sen- section, he said it died, sadly. Yeah, that sucks. But... Yeah, it really does, because that was, it was a very rare card. But he had it, and he he tested it in modern games, which is kind of interesting. Um, yeah. So definitely go check that out after you finish watching this, of course. <laughs> uh, yeah, like, I just looking at... I'm just sort of scrolling over eBay right now just to see what's about. There's, like, two XT models, both of them 512 meg. Um But something I will mention about this generation of ATR cards is... Uh, one thing that kind of made them a little bit attractive is some companies like HIS and I believe Sapphire as well made AGP versions of the mid-range cards. Mm. Um, I actually had and recently sold a twenty-nine, uh, sorry, twenty HD twenty-six hundred XT five twelve meg uh, HIS card that had like the uh, ice whatever, it's like the blue PCB with the blue and silver uh, cooler on that on the external exhaust one. Really, really nice card. Um, but that thing was atrocious for drivers um, because it ne- needed some special kind of drivers that only HIS themselves developed. None of the standard ATI drivers or, or yeah. uh, Radian drivers that you could get at the time, none of them recognized the card. And it would cause a blue screen whenever you used certain, uh, like turned on certain features uh, in like settings, like for instance, I remember playing the original Far Cry, and when you set everything to the highest, highest quality, which I think is like uh, Ultra or something like that, um, the system would just blue screen, uh, and it was like a common thing for that particular car that it was just horrendous with drivers. Uh, so That's I got interesting. Rid of that. I know, I know, like because uh, there was a 3850 AGP, which is widely yep. considered the fastest AGP graphics card. Uh, HIS made that, but also Sapphire made that yes. and i don't know maybe some other companies i wonder if you needed special drivers for those because i don't I, own one i've never used it yeah i don't i'm wanting to get one of the 3850s for my collection because i'd love to be able to just play around with it and sort of do a video on it and uh you know talk about what, whether it's worth getting for a collection and stuff but they can actually go they're a little bit pricey these days um but i don't think they would be as popular today if there wasn't good driver support so there must be some decent drivers out there, otherwise people probably just wouldn't buy them. They would go for something a little bit slower, or maybe something from NVIDIA. Yeah, I mean, um, it would make sense so. by then, like AMD, as they were known by then, uh, would have probably added official support for those. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, good good single-slot cards, though. Um but yeah, then uh, we obviously have, uh, like looking forward, moving forward from uh, the 2900, a little bit closer because ATI had, uh, like in part one we covered like the 3000 series, 4000 series, 5000 series, uh, 6000 series and GCN, which were all arguably some very successful times for, for AMD. Um, now we're coming into an era where AMD is definitely really like... Uh, they're really starting to drop the ball a little bit in terms of like they've got no high-end GPU other than Vega, which is kind of not doing totally too well. Um, partly thanks to the whole mining thing, which we're not really going to go into detail anymore, which kind of covered a little bit in part one. But um, uh, what's your yeah, take? It's, it's, it isn't just that, though. It's 
you know, the card itself, Vega 5664, were uh, several months late. Uh, I think it was something like 10 months uh, late um, after, like, the, the GTX 1080 came out. By then, you had, like, the 1080 Ti. Um, you know, they... Not only were they late, but they it's it's kind of like a repeat of the 2900 XT. They were too hot. They they underperformed, you know. Um, and just like the 2900 XT where the, that card, they priced it at $400 because they knew we can't compete with NVIDIA $600 cards. So we're going to price it accordingly. You know, the Vega 64 at most could compete with the 1080, not the TI. So, you know, they... They, the card itself was kind of a a a failure. Um, it's almost like Nvidia. I mean, Nvidia's put it been put in this situation where they've had uh, ever since the six hundred generation, their highest end flagship core is no longer their highest end GPU that they release. Their like seven eighty, six eighty, nine eighty is always going to be a uh, is now sorry like a, a cut down version and because they just don't uh, like ATI uh, AMD hasn't had a competing card to actually um, you know really stretch NVIDIA to its absolute limit every single generation um, so NVIDIA has kind of been sitting pretty for the last couple of generations and ATI I keep saying ATI oh my god <laughs> <laughs> AMD has been just sitting in the background going, okay, well, clearly we can't compete with that. We're going to work on a new architecture, uh, which is Vega. We're going to take our time to improve it, and when it's ready, we will release it. Uh, But in the meantime, we're going to focus on the core demographic, which is like the RX range, the 400 and 500, which we mentioned in Part A, uh, which were very good cards. Um, And so they had their time to sort of sit back and go, we need a new architecture, GCN's sort of coming to the end, or the initial GCN that they had is coming to the end of its life. We need a new, you know, new big chip, new big core uh, to take us forward. And Vega was hyped so much uh, leading up to it. Everyone was like, we're just going to have to wait and see when Vega comes out because the 10 series is, uh, you know, it, it's how, how good is the 10 series is questionable because we have to compare it against Vega when it finally launch, launches. Um, I had several people that I've been building systems for over that uh, time frame before Vega and just after Vega that were like, no, I'm going to hold out until Vega comes out because I reckon it's going to be pretty good. Um, On paper, it was supposed to have all the specs, all the features and things like that, but uh, it was just delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed. And then when it finally did come out, it really was lackluster. Um, Yeah. It's you yeah. know part of the part part of the problem with it too is that they really didn't improve the architecture enough, and coming from the R9 Fury, they still had four thousand and ninety six stream processors. Yeah, they did not improve the number of stream pro- even though they they had the benefit of a die shrink. Um, you know they had the addition of HBM two memory, which didn't really improve bandwidth, actually reduced bandwidth a little bit. Uh, and mostly improved in memory density, so they could now pack, you know, 8 gigabytes and so on. But yeah. it's, you know, to their credit, yes, drivers have improved the performance of the 56 and 64 quite a bit since launch. Again, going into the whole thing of, you know, AMD needing more time to get the drivers up to speed, um, you know, they're... They're decent performing cards, but that doesn't really change the fact that, you know, NVIDIA pretty much had an entire year uncontested uh, with the, you know, the original 1080. So it's kind of hard to think about, you know, going back to their successes, they're remembering their successes, and then uh, in the context of how they're doing right now. Do you um, know what I... I think it's this. AMD... Being in the position that they've been in, meaning meaning they've been almost forced to make sure that they innovate um, to stay relevant and to keep themselves uh, like uh, like in the game in terms of features and things like that, so they don't become irrelevant, has put them in a situation where they they were chasing that first to HBM on a consumer card tagline, 
mm-hmm. that so much focus was on that that they didn't stop to think, well, actually, the yields of HBM is so low that it's going to cripple the actual you know ability for us to mass produce these cards at a affordable and a volume like a big enough volume that's going to really make it worth it. Um, yeah, and then in, in Nvidia, they didn't have a monopoly. A monopoly. They didn't have an exclusivity to HBM two. Because yeah. by the time HBM2 came along, NVIDIA started using it for their top um, workstation cards. Yep. yep. Uh, like the, the best, like the um, GV100 based Volta cards use HBM2 memory. And, you know, you're talking about the customers buying these things are getting a whole bunch of them. So they're probably hogging up all of that inventory. And now I think there's finally like multiple companies or they're will be multiple companies producing HBM2, but it hasn't yeah. really mitigated the problem, especially in the context of, of miners and uh, everybody buying up these cars. Uh, there yeah. was a brief moment, I remember, just towards the tail end of last year, where I finally saw some Vega 56s and 64s available at MSRP. Um, you know, that quickly disappeared. Um but the fact it remains, AMD, you know, they didn't do enough to to develop them, and they they really needed they really need something beyond GCN, you know. Yeah. Um, and this you know, is where. The, sorry, go ahead. I was just thinking back to like the the Vega Frontier Edition, um, you know. They launched it as like this, like early like release version of Vega. Like, hey, look, you can get your hands on. It was like crazy expensive, and yeah. it was meant to tackle. It's kind of a gaming card. It's kind of a workstation card. It's a jack of all trades, but a master of none. Uh, and it really didn't yeah. do that well at all. It was, you know, I it, it was I look a back total at flop. the launch. Yeah, I look back at the launch of uh, Vega and the Frontier Edition, Frontier Edition specifically. And there's only a few words that I can use to describe this, and that is uh, a clusterfuck. And I apologize <laughs> if that language is a bit much. Uh, I, I apologize. We may end up bleeping that in the edit. But um, the, the launch of that card was just so all over the place. Uh, you had outlets saying it's a gaming card. You had marketing saying that it's not a gaming card, that it's a workstation card. And you had AMD you know, double taking, like going back on their own marketing and then their own opinions of what the card is really aimed at halfway through its life cycle now to the point now where they were marketing it as a mining card or like a, uh, not a mining card, but a, uh, what do they call it? Um, Shit, the word escapes me, but the the type of cryptocurrency mining technique, whatever it's called, uh, the, they're marketing it as that sort of a card now and they were, I believe it was Linus Tech Tips and one other company, uh, I don't know, I think it was Gamers Nexus actually might have done a video on it where they were um, showing that there was almost no stock of Vega 56 and Vega 64 because AMD seemed to be pumping out the uh, Frontier Editions, uh, like putting all their resources into the Frontier Edition cards um, because they seemed to be selling to miners better than what the 56 and 64s were. Um, which was really really odd thing. Uh, like I think it was late January when that was reported on. Um, but one thing I would like to mention is I reckon AMD really needs to almost go back to the drawing board here and think about how they're designing a chip because at this point in time we have Nvidia that's doing completely runaway success with their current architecture and the architecture that they're they're holding on to, which they haven't even released into. Uh, like gaming cards these days with like Volta and whatever they've got at the moment because they just don't need to invest that money to make those cards because their current products that they've now had for a couple of years are so successful uh, and and unchallenged. Um, I think for AMD to really start winning back and actually clawing their way back up in the GPU market, they need to do something different. Maybe start designing, like instead of designing that single core Uh, graphics card maybe they start doing dual chip cards again Uh, doing something that is too efficient small cores on a single PCB and instead of it being looked at as a unique and one-off or or like a limited version of or like just the high tier only maybe they start you know making a uh, architecture that really can scale very well like Vega is known to scale 
and just start pairing them up and having multiple Vegas on a single card uh, to start giving yeah. them that higher end performance. I mean, it, it is speculated that their next generation architecture will take advantage of the Infinity Fabric and maybe be able to have multiple cores on a single die. Yep. But, you know, and that would be kind of an efficient thing, but it's just kind of funny for me to think back on the fact that AMD realized a long time ago that they wouldn't be able to go head-to-head with NVIDIA anymore. They kind of just became a runaway success, especially after the launch of the 8800 series, the launch of CUDA, and then their big push into the... Um, high performance computing market, the research market, you know, where these massive servers, uh, supercomputers are being built with their GPUs. Yeah. Um, AMD, of course, wanted that money, but they just couldn't get in the, into it, and NVIDIA became entrenched. Yeah. And yeah. that revenue that they get from that one market, it's almost become, it's, you know, they say gaming is still the priority, but I mean, come on, that's. They save all their best stuff for that high performance market. Yep. And AMD, literally, they're just trying to go after trying to go after the gaming performance. Um. So you know they saw this problem already. Make something like the thirty eight seventy or the forty eight seventy, where you're targeting that that juicy that the sweet spot the the two ninety nine or the uh, you know. 399 at best, you know, performance range, uh, and yeah. get the most efficiency out of that, um, and not try to go head to head with NVIDIA in the very top performance. Um, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. And I don't know, maybe that was part of the reason why Roger Kadori left AMD is because he, you know, he, the Vega was not a success. Polaris was, they did a very good job with the mainstream products, but. You know, uh, AMD is essentially leaving the high-end market unchallenged in a lot of yep. ways, very top end of it at least. Yeah. But I think, I mean, I could... think AMD, AMD definitely does need to almost go back to the drawing board and do something different um, because at this point, NVIDIA's just completely got the, uh, the uh, you know, NVIDIA's com- no longer like, their primary market is no longer gaming graphics cards. It's AI. Uh, like a hundred percent, like their their main focus on all of their architecture going forwards will be AI compute uh, cards, and then the gamers will get the trickled down, uh, like slightly modified versions of those high end chips that they produce. Um, yeah, which means you that think about you think about like the like the Titan V, you know, it's kind of a gaming card, but it's also kind of still its workstation, its AI roots. It's yeah. got the, uh, uh, what are they called? Tesla cores, or I'm not sure what they're, but they're Tensa they're, core. Tensa, yeah. specifically made just for AI, AI processing, completely useless to a consumer card. Yeah. That's a valuable chunk of the transistor budget being dedicated to this market. Yeah. And these cards are being developed specifically for this now, where they're, a good chunk of the focus is on that. For good reason. Yep. And uh, with uh, the massive... I don't know if anyone's been following the success of NVIDIA side of things. Uh, like, AM, uh, NVIDIA's revenue has skyrocketed ever since the, the takeoff of the whole AI GPU compute uh, revolution and just how successful they've been in that. And with ATI just not having almost any of that market share beyond their few Fire Pro cards that they still currently have... Um, which I don't even know if they're producing anymore because of Vega. I don't know. I don't even know what the latest Fire Pro card they is. They have a Radeon. It's, they have the Radeon Pro. Right. It's the Radeon Pro. That's what they renamed it to. So they don't do Fire Pro. It's a Radeon Pro. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I don't they even know how relevant... They those, but... Yeah. I don't know how relevant they are in the workstation space anymore... Uh, apart from maybe like CAD or 3D rendering that might use that really good OpenCL performance, uh, Nvidia's kind of just got everything covered on their on their side of the the stack. Um, yeah, and AMD has always been kind of a cash strapped company because they haven't yeah. for a long long time they haven't been competitive in the CPU market as well, and it's easy yeah. to feel sorry for them because how can you compete with Intel? 
how can you compete with NVIDIA, let alone both at the same time? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, these are both companies just at the top of their game. They're so influential, they're basically writing the game engines. Even though the consoles are made for, or not just game engines, but software in general. Like, so much of the, the research software is being written in CUDA. You know, it's it's... Even though there's consoles built using GCN chips, you still have all these games with hair works and NVIDIA's technology being plugged in that just completely yeah. kill performance on uh, in AMD's cards. Um, you Which know, it's very, almost like just hamstrung against them. It's it's a very controversial thing as well, that whole NVIDIA GameWorks thing, because um, I think for several years, uh, I, I want to say around the 7970 generation, uh, there was a big bold claim that I believe uh, AMD was making that NVIDIA was intentionally uh, hindering performance on uh, in games that were developed with NVIDIA Gameworks and then systems that were running ATI or Radian uh, yeah, Radian cards uh, they were intentionally getting hindered because they were running features specifically designed to run on uh, NVIDIA hardware um, and I do remember a lot of articles and a lot of news and a lot of uh, like toing and throwing between them about who's doing what and is it legit and uh, I don't know what the outcome of that was but it was really interesting like sort of poo flinging thing going on between the companies and the game developers and things like that um, but yeah I, I'm not sure like I'm really while I'm really really happy with the success of Ryzen and what AMD is doing with their CPUs I'm genuinely scared about what's going to happen to the Radeon Technologies Group and the future of the AMD video cards because right now, I don't know if we have any news that's positive about what's happening next or what they're working on next um, because yeah. uh, what's if, one of the biggest anything, things... we have negative rumors. The, the next architecture is Navi. You know, people yep. are saying, oh, it's going to be just as bad as Vega, possibly. We don't know, necessarily. No. I mean, they could stand to add some more stream processors in there at the very least. But, you know, it's... They don't have Raja Kadori anymore. So going forward, they have to continue on without them. They have uh, David Wang, who is the uh, new senior vice president of engineering now. And they kind of split off the engineering with the, uh, the general manager and the business side of the Radeon Technology Group. Yeah. to what they hope make it more agile and more uh, efficient because I can't I think Roger Kadori was kind of doing a little bit of both I'm not yeah. really sure but um, I think he had uh, they basically split his job title um, or his role into two separate people um, yeah which which should make them more efficient at what they're doing um, which business in theory, decision yeah. wise is smart but what really sucks is the fact that um, Roger had such a big, vast amount of knowledge and influence on the direction of the Radiant Technologies Group that all of that information and knowledge that he has now taken over to Intel, um, I mean, who knows what we're going to see out of Intel over the next sort of five to six years. Um, yeah. yeah. And honestly, honestly, it's hard to say because, okay, yeah, AMD, who knows? I mean, David Wang could be the, like this complete genius um he's been supposedly i was just reading an article while making these notes he was with amd before with you know developing yeah. radion chips and he came back sort of like what roger Kadori did uh but i can imagine roger Kadori is uh i'm just not, not sure what i'm saying his whole name every time i'm not i'm sure that raja is you know was probably feeling the strain of the you know the limited budget you know the the limited capital at amd which yeah. are not limits that he has at Intel. And in some some ways, you might think, well, maybe it takes an Intel to defeat an NVIDIA or to really take on an NVIDIA. And I know that Intel is specifically doing this to go after like the AI research and go after yep. NVIDIA's market share in those big, high-performance computing scenarios, research scenarios, uh, you know, with the added benefit of, hey, we can play games too. Yeah, and the the other benefit too for that is, um, you know, in terms of the mining world, we'll have three competitors in the graphics, 
you know, the world of graphics. It doesn't solve yeah. the shortage of memory chips, but at least we'll have three companies making graphics chips, and hopefully we'll have some dedicated mining hardware too to alleviate some of the pressure as well. Yeah, and I think um, that's I think that's something that uh, recent news in videos uh, been sort of teasing out or some leaked information about um, their uh, Turing based or supposed Turing based uh, mining cards, which at this point is absolutely speculation. Um, I know uh, Steve from Gamers Nexus has put out a bit of information um, about what he knows, and he was leaking some information in uh, some hints about it in some of his previous videos as well. Um, but yeah, we're in a really tough time at the moment where AMD is really not in a good place for their uh, graphics division at all. And what I don't know. What are the odds? What are the odds that they might spin it off? I'm thinking that. What do you reckon of Intel buying the Radeon Technologies Group? I mean, I see that as a possibility just because, well, it would make it easier for Raja Kadori to work, first of all, without infringing a bunch of copyrights. Because yep. he does have all this knowledge, you know, even if he can't take design papers with him, he knows how these things are built. Yeah. So he would have to re reinvent the wheel in order to not infringe those copyrights. Um,. And so that either requires a cross-licensing deal with Intel and AMD, which they already do on other technologies anyway. And um, which they have recently just done with their Vega architecture anyway. Yeah, which is more of a partnership of AMD providing the hardware to Intel instead of uh, licensing the designs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is, it's it a is slightly different, different setup. But in order for Roger Kadori to make an actual GPU himself, you know, an Intel GPU, he would have to make it completely different or different enough to, that, so that AMD couldn't sue or whatever. Or he'd have to yeah. license technologies from AMD. Or Intel could just say, hey, we'll buy Ra Radeon Technology Groups. You mm -hmm. could just go back to being a CPU company again. And right now that might be kind of attractive because AMD is doing well with their CPUs. Yeah. I mean, I wonder Make if that would be the saving grace for AMD as a whole, like, while they are doing very well in the CPU market, if something happens in the next three to four years that suddenly puts Intel straight back up in the limelight for the best of the best, no matter what target, you know, range you're looking at, uh, I don't think AMD would be able to recover from another string of uh, unsuccessful CPU um you know releases uh especially if they don't do something with the gpu side so i think if they were to sell off radiant technologies group solely start focusing and really putting all of their energy into the the ryzen architecture and you know moving that forwards uh and innovating on that we could suddenly have a proper cpu versus cpu like amd versus intel again and then if intel was to buy the radiant technologies group I don't know what they would rename it to or whatever. I can't really see Intel Radeon working too well, but... Um, Could happen. Yeah. It's got recognition, brand recognition, and it's valuable. It does, but I don't know. Like, I, I don't know what they would do, whether they would just completely drop the, the group, the naming at all, and just start fresh. But I, th I think... Intel needs to do something because they're going to get left behind by NVIDIA in terms of the AI side of stuff. So I think definitely getting Raja from AMD was a very, very important thing for their future. Um, but it's it's really a shame to see AMD in this situation that they're in right now. Yeah. Um, it, it only gets more challenging as, you know, we talk about, well, yeah, they're facing Intel and their CPUs and facing NVIDIA and their GPUs. And then if Intel's making GPUs as well... Yeah. How does AMD not just commit seppuku right then? Yeah, I can guarantee you Intel's already probably got a bigger R&D budget for the GPU side than AMD has had in the last they, they, 10 years. They can, waste, they can waste money on an initiative like Larabee, yeah. uh, which was their uh, previous attempt at, a, at to make a GPU, and not really sweat it. Yeah. They they make so much money. It's their market share is so ridiculous, and Nvidia's market share, despite AMD having great mainstream cards, is crazy high. Yeah, 
Yeah. So you know, it's it's as far as it, from AMD's perspective, I know that there's been a lot of earnings reports where Radeon was bringing in the money for them. There was kind of the breadwinner for them. But at the same time, I'm not a business person, but you're not spending money on developing GPUs either if you sell it off. So, yeah. you know, eh, it's it's a mixed bag and we'll have to see. I think it's definitely in that sort of situation. We're just going to have to see what happens. Um, and I don't think everyone's going to be happy with the outcome because it, either it's going to mean that they're being sold off or they're going to just keep trying to stick at it and eventually just put themselves in an even bigger or worse situation financially again for the for the Radiant Technologies group at least. Uh, unless they happen to come out with something that is just a miracle, like a miracle saving GPU architecture, <laughs> kind of like what GCN was uh, again. So, yeah. That kind of leads into a whole bunch of speculation about things we really don't know. Yeah. Uh, we're just kind of spitballing what you know these companies might try to do to survive. Um, and so uh, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap it up there. That was a uh, sort of a take on the ATIs. Um, you know, some of their not so great successes or non successes. Um, yeah. Which, honestly, there's not a lot of if you really kind of tally it all up. I think uh, we had a lot more of an easier time talking about uh, the successes in in side A, um, to be honest. Uh, They have a pretty good track record. And I know it sounds like really kind of dire right now with their current situation, but if you actually look back and you look at the history, it can kind of show you that, hey, they've done pretty well for themselves not just as a ATI, but even during the AMD years, you know, yeah. um, just maybe not quite the heights of glory of where they were, had the top performing cards or whatever. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that's gonna about do it for side B. Um, and, uh, thanks very much for watching. And, uh, like I said, in uh, the first uh, podcast that we did, we're going to try to make this a monthly thing. Don't hold us to it, because we're only human. Um, but, uh, you know, um, so far we're having fun, and I hope you're having fun watching it. So, uh, uh, this is uh, Nathan for Pixel Pipes, and uh, we have... Um, Aaron, or Modzi, from Modzi's Retro Collection. And if you're not subscribed to him, what are you doing? Uh, and until next time, take care. Um, uh, I would just like to do a final quick mention, sorry, that, uh, if you are subscribed to me and you have been, uh, looking for videos of late, uh, I do apologize if I haven't had anything out in the last, uh, little bit, uh, had some family th- stuff going on behind the scenes, so it's been a little bit busy, but, uh, yeah, we'll be, we, um, I think both of us have got some new videos coming soon that are very interesting. We're going to be have, uh, you know, can't wait to get out. So, um, see you guys soon.